Hi friends, thank you for downloading today's podcast. Be sure to check us out on the web at www.thescenshow.com where you can find our blog and find the new exclusives and new offers to you, the listeners. Don't forget to check us out and be sure to, if you're if able to, consider donating to The Scene Show. And in order to help us out, in order to offer incentives to guests and uh, buy, uh, buy new equipment and things of that nature, 100% of your proceeds will go back into the show. And uh, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy today's broadcast. And welcome to this edition of The Scene Show. Great to be with you here on Monday, as always, Monday evening. Now, I called this episode the, I originally titled it in my notes, The Fall of Scholasticism. But really, I think it reflects more, it reflects more the, I would call it more the pre-Reformation church or the pre-Reformation reformers. Because that's what we're going to look at for our purposes today. Now, this, I think, is a good example of where church history and historical theology kind of diverge a little bit. And we're, we're considered more with the thought rather than the events. So I don't say much about the the pre-Reformation corruption of the church, although it's there. I think it's important to mention it. I didn't, you know, get a sense of reading Olson that Olson kind of brushes over things like the Avignon Papacy, which is where the papacy was held captive in Avignon, France, and. So I I don't um I didn't get a sense that Olson you know that Olson really talked about those things in much in detail. And so we're not going to do that either. But if you are interested in that and I would like to learn more about that, I could certainly direct you to some sources that would be good for learning more about, or learning, even if it's just to learn more about this period, because we're getting into the pre-Reformation reformers today, and the next week we're headed right into the Reformation. So uh, we're getting, we're getting, uh, we're getting through this series. We're, we're um. We're getting through this series rather, um, well, I wouldn't say rather quickly. We've been on it for a while now. But I have uh, stuck with it. And plan to stick with it until the end. And we've had some, some, you know, like I split up things and I think we did two parts on Aquinas, and um, that was to uh, split up that um, so that you got a better sense of it. And we're going to split up the Reformation, of course. We're not going to cover. We're not going to cover the entire Reformation in one episode. It'll probably take at least three episodes to get through the Reformation in in its various forms. You have, of course, Luther, and then John Calvin, and then the English Reformation. So that'll be at least three episodes on the Protestant Reformation. That's what's coming down the pike. And so today, what we're looking at today uh, will will greatly influence that. Because these are the the pre Reformation reformers, uh, William of Ockham, John Wycliffe, and um, Desiderius Erasmus, or Erasmus of Rotterdam, as he's called, and they are 
condemned by the church for the most part. I don't think Erasmus is ever condemned by the church, at least not that I saw. But William of Ockham and John Wycliffe are. But they contribute to the development of Protestant thought. And again, I'm going to be as objective and as um, you know, I'm going to wear my uh, historian's lens rather than my church philosophical lens and um, or my, you know, my different hats, if you will. Because in my education, I have a BA in history, and now the master's in philo- Catholic philosophy, so I'm going to try and use that, that BA in history and my training from that to be as fair and objective uh, as possible. And, of course... You know, I think with these things, there's always, you're always going to take a view or a side, if you will. You're always going to pick sides on these things because we bring our own sort of theological and philosophical bias to the, well, to the historical project in this case. But so I'm going to be as fair as possible to both sides and hope and pray that this will be an objective look at sort of the pre-Reformation thinkers. Now, what you have going on in Europe is you have the plague decimating the population, and then you have the rise of the Renaissance, where there's this great rebirth of culture throughout Europe and it's it's not, and the humanism that develops in this time is not secular humanism as it becomes, but it is very much a religious humanism, and Erasmus is known as a Christian humanist. So kind of emphasizing the individual is what humanism does. And so when... So what's important to to pay attention to is that because of the corruption happening in ecclesial circles, so the church circles of the church, the the legitimate theologians, as I call them, those seeking God and seeking to understand God, will begin to seek shelter under the kings of Europe, under secular rulers. And this is really, now the secular rulers, of course, have their own axe to grind, their own, I don't know if you'd say their own agenda, but they they basically want, are doing it for power, you know, they can, it's their opportunity to take back power because this, this utopic vision of the church-run state in Europe is going to fall apart in this period. When we see the rise of things like nationalism and um, so you see that coming in the background and it and it will um ultimately come out really it's been the Reformation we'll see it come out but um So you have the the Reformation, and this is this is very much the transitional era between the High Middle Ages and the Reformation, and it is a period of creativity and an emphasis on the humanities, since the term humanism. Some artists look back to pre-Christian pagan sources for inspiration, while others seek a more Christian flavor to their work. So you have. So I'm gonna... <coughs> Excuse me. This is the first time I've ever sneezed on a podcast, but it happens. But so you have the the first two, William of Ockham and Wycliffe, 
they react heavily against the authority of the Pope and the church hierarchy and launched a movement known in, in Catholic thought as conciliarism. And what conciliarism is is basically saying that the the church the decisions of the the decision the can't speak tonight the decision making of the church should be run by councils rather than the popes. Okay, and that's that's a reaction against the abuses of the papacy in this period. So, and this this influences Catholic thought today. So it doesn't go away, and it, it, even though it's officially condemned by the Church from this in this time period, and I ultimately think you have to take a, some of these condemnations with a grain of salt. Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying that, but but that we have to take them with a grain of salt because you can see that they're not motivated by spiritual motivation. They're motivated by the desire and the quest for power. So the, the church, the, you know, there's a lot of corruption going on in the church. And what these three thinkers try and do is they try and call for reform in their own... Um, time periods. They're not all living at the same time. The latest of them is Erasmus, who is a contemporary of Luther. But Wycliffe and Occam will die before the Reformation comes to fruition. Or or comes to revolt, whatever however you want to look at it. But let's look at that William of Occam first. He becomes a friar and taught philosophy and theology. He's eventually condemned a heretic by the Pope at Avignon, but he escapes and makes it to the court of King Louis in ba of Bavaria and Munich, Germany. So you see this pattern emerge of taking refuge with a secular ruler, and that becomes important because Luther is going to take refuge at Saxony. after he's condemned. Now, Occam, you might know, you probably have heard of Occam's razor to explain phenomena, which basically says that it's, that it, the simplest explanation is the best explanation. And that is where we have the foundations for modern science because um, because most people at that time were were dualists, so they they in their explanation of things. So basically, they if you have a rock, if a rock falls down a hill, some would they would say the the rock falling is the physical explanation, and then an angel or a demon pushed it, but. Uh, Occam's simplest explanation says, no, the rock just fell simply because because it fell. There's no explanation. There's no, there's no need to have that spiritual explanation for it. He rejects the realist forms of knowledge and is a conceptualist. And I'm not really going to go into much of the semantics of that because it gets philosophical and... Um, for our purposes, it's not really necessary. But what I want to note is that Occam's emphasis on conciliarism leaves a lasting impact on the church. It's rejected by the church, but it does end up influencing European culture at large. And so it does have long-term long -term effects. So then you have John Wycliffe. And Wycliffe is known for his, you know, he's known really for his Bible translation, the Wycliffe, I think there's a Wycliffe uh, Bible Society that's named after him. But 
um, really his, you know, he's, he, like, like, um, Occam, he believes that the church should be governed by the people of God through the representatives and the bishops of conciliarism. He believed that the Bible should be translated into a language that people could read and understand for themselves. So, again, putting the Bible in the hands of believers. He fought against papal corruption, and like Luther, he rejected the sale of indulgences for the remission of sins. Now, the sale of indulgences, that's something that we're going to talk about more in depth next week when we get into the Reformation. And we will see the the corruption. It's basically, you know, selling, paying to remit sin. And Luther is, uh, famously rails against that. But his best, Wycliffe's best known achievement was advocating the position that faith in the scriptures were enough in terms of matters of faith and life. So he doesn't go all the way in formulating the doctrine of faith and grace alone for salvation, but he is the really the precursor to this to this idea to the, that becomes one of the hallmarks of Protestant theology. Now you have Erasmus and Christian humanism. And like I said, Erasmus is a contemporary of Luther. He becomes um he joins an Augustinian monastery and becomes a priest. And he advocates for the reform of the church. And he seeks a middle road through the between the thought of the scholastics and the reformers, which he saw as being too radical. And it is interesting because Erasmus goes through and he privately supports Luther or quietly supported Luther, but ultimately saw him as being a bit of a fanatic for refusing to recant his heresies and just the way in which he splits the church. So I, I think it's fair to say that Erasmus was um, a reformer, but Luther was a revolutionary or a radical, and we, we will... We will see more of that next week. But Erasmus' most famous work is The Praise of Folly. And he, he, he takes aim at the whole medieval pattern of outward spirituality. So he condemns things like the unjust penances that are inflicted on people, pilgrimage and the relics and asceticism. He goes against all of that. But he he looks more towards the you know towards the abuses of it rather than rejecting it wholesale. So all of these three men play a role in bringing about the Protestant Reformation. And Erasmus, as also noted, tried to perform delicate surgery on the church, but Luther was a revolutionary or a radical, and he just just creates a, new, creates a new organism, basically. And so we're going to talk about that next week, where we will finally, where we will see what finally causes the break between the growing reforms of the Church of Rome and, and ultimately the, what splits off to become the Protestant Church. Now, I, I think, you know, this period is important because it shows that there are those working within the church to try and reform the the abuses that are going on the the corruption that's happening so that's ultimately why i think this period is important because it shows that the reform was coming from within you know that there were people trying to trying to seek God, trying to trying to do what was right in a time that is filled with 
corruption and injustice and things like that. And so we're going to check on that next week in part one of our series on the Reformation. And um, we will we will get into Luther and Calvin in the following weeks, and and then uh, the Reformation in England, and we'll see how those how all of those things play out, and then and then after that we will get into the we will start getting into the modern period or the the modern and contemporary period of Christianity where um, Protestant thoughts, Protestant and Catholic thoughts splits into liberal and conservative factions. And so we will talk about all of that in the coming weeks. So you won't want to miss it here. Um, we're a little, we're running a little short today, I think, um, that's good. It'll end up being about 25 minutes or so with the introduction and the, uh, so basically I just covered again the main points and I would recommend that if you want to do further reading, I recommend Olson's volume and, uh, there are other sources as well, again, that I could direct you to if you're interested in doing more reading on this period, uh, just send a, send me an email at uh, T Yakalis, that's T Y A K A L I S, at hotmail dot com, and I will do my best to to get back to you on uh, on that. Then also, I want to mention um, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find a series on the spiritual disciplines that we're covering as part of the. Lenten Bible study and at the academy, um, but also, you know, but also as a way for folks to catch up on that who maybe are not able to get out to the Bible study. That's a great way to, to catch up on that. So check out all those things. Be sure to check us out at www.thescenshow.com and let us know what you think. So take care and God bless.